anyway, anyway, with that said, here we are, Revelation chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the subject of the Antichrist. And what I'll be doing is uh, I'll be reading those 10 verses to you, and I'm going to give to you uh, an introduction, laying a foundation, developing it, and then moving on into the study. I have to be honest with you, it's, uh, it can be ca uh, complicated. And so I take my time to try and make sure I'm accurate with this. And so uh, I'll be giving to you, as, as I mentioned, a, an introduction. Then I'm going to begin looking at this verse by verse. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 10. Revelation chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. John writes, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beasts. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So what we're going to have a picture of here, an introduction to, if you will, is uh, the kingdom of Antichrist. And we're also going to get a picture of the one who is referred to as Antichrist. And so as we begin, we need to begin with a foundational kind of illustration and thought. You see, we live in a world that is very familiar with what is called knockoffs. We've all heard of that. What's a knockoff? Well, a knockoff is an unlicensed copy of something that's intended to be sold at a lower price than the original. All you need to do is go to a swap meet or various places, and you can buy what they call knockoffs, you know, a Gucci purse or, or Chanel number no. 5. You can, you know, I've done that. I... Didn't realize it, you know, and I bought Marie some perfume at a swap meet for Christmas, and I was real thrilled. I mean, it was a gallon, and it was only 10 bucks, and you know, so anyway, we're all familiar with, no I really did, we're all, <laughs> we're all familiar with, with knockoffs. They can be jewelry, they can be jeans, makeup, they can be shoes, they can be furniture, artwork, they can be cologne, sunglasses, even cars and watches. There are what are called knockoffs. Some of them look like the genuine thing, but they, they just will never match the quality of the original. So we know there is the genuine, and we know that there is the fake. Well, Satan is in the business of producing what we would call knockoffs. What he presents, in other words, looks genuine, but what, what is offered doesn't match the quality of the original. So what we see in Scripture is that Satan offers a, a, a false Jesus, a false spirit. He offers a false gospel. He has false ministers, and he even has a false kingdom. Now, Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians in chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, when he said, I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. 
This is the false things that he, that he provides. These are the things that Satan tries to, to present to us as if they're the, the real thing. He has planted, even in Christian churches, false Christians. And there are false Christians in every church. And Jesus spoke of this. And he gave a story to illustrate it. It's the parable of the wheat and the tares. When you look in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 13, there are several parables or stories, illustrations, that Jesus gives concerning a variety of things related to the church. And in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, and then verses 36 to 43, he gave a parable of, of a man who had sowed good seed in his field. He says that when men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and then he went his way. The grain sprouted, it produced a crop, but there were what are called tares, and tares sprouted amongst the wheat. His servant saw this and asked the owner why the field had tares. And the owner knew why and, and told him that an enemy has sowed these tares. His men wanted to go into the field to remove the tares. The owner said no. He said that if they went in to remove tares, they might also remove real wheat. He said, let them continue to grow. And at the time of harvest, the reapers will remove them. So he later explained the parable, saying that the tares are sons of the wicked one. Now, when you planted wheat, you had what are called our darnel. Darnel looks like wheat, and you don't know the difference until it is fully bloomed. You know, And so that's how you can tell the difference between darnel and wheat. Well, the problem is with darnel, is darnel is something that actually is used to dull the senses and is also a poison. So when you read about Jesus using the term the tares and the wheat, what he's saying is the enemy has sowed something, it's called a soporific, it's something that dulls the senses, something that makes you drowsy. And he has sown that in the church in the form of what are called tares. And not only do these darnell, do these tares, cause the church to become drowsy, but the tares also poison the church. And so when Jesus chose to use this illustration of wheat and tares, it isn't just that these look like the real thing, it's the effect that they have on the real thing. And that's why the men said, there are, there are tares in, in the field, we should go and pull them out. And, and the owner says, no, we're going to let them grow until they're fully blossomed, because when they're fully blossomed, then they can be pulled in. It isn't going to be you who pulls them out. It's going to be the angels in the last day. And that's what he's speaking about. You see, the enemy that sowed them, because he says an enemy sowed them, is the devil. And he sows his, his uh, counterfeits amongst the wheat. In giving the peril, Jesus made it clear that the church was going to be infiltrated. There would be people in the visible church who were not saved, but they still attend. They still go to church. Well, how can that, how is it possible that people who don't know the Lord will be members of good standing in a church? How, how can that happen? Well, Jesus said, while men slept. When men slept, the church is asleep. It's asleep in the light. It's not on the alert. It's not aware of infiltration. So what happens is the devil inspires. The devil inspires people to go to churches. The devil inspires unsaved people, sometimes even pastor churches. And you may say here in California at this time, is that possible? Are you kidding me? Are you saying that there are unsaved people pastoring churches? And the answer is absolutely. In Germany, they have the national church. I've been to Germany several times. They have what is called the national church. You don't even have to be a Christian to pastor it. You just go through school. You get the credentials. You have a church. And that's the, it's the state church. And so that exists to this day. And is it possible that there are, are churches pastored by unbelievers in, in other places? Yeah, I've heard the testimony. I remember a, a pastor who was teaching in a church service who had pastored a church. I think he had said something like 20, 30 years. And one day as he was giving the message, the Spirit of God said to him, you're not even saved and you're preaching messages. He said, I was so convicted, I gave my heart to Christ through my own message. That actually happens. You may not believe it, but it's true that people pastor churches. They're up here just like I am, preaching to people about Jesus and all. 
but they don't know the Lord that they're preaching about. Not only that, but every time a pastor can teach, myself included, there are always people, or it's possible for them always to be people listening to the message, of course, who, who don't know the Lord, but maybe they've been members in good standing for a long time. Maybe they're even on church boards or serving in committees or doing ministry. In fact, they don't know the Lord. And what happens is their lack of knowledge of God actually dulls the spirits of those who do know him. So somebody who loves the Lord and is speaking about Jesus to somebody else may have a friend who goes to the same church and that person who goes to the same church later on speaks to the believer and says, you really, you know, you're too hard, too harsh, you're too judgmental. You, and they're dulling that person and making it so that that person doesn't even preach the gospel. I remember many years ago now, I was at my house. We were having a youth uh, uh, gathering at my home when I was uh, a single man. And a uh, young lady was in the uh, front room, my parents' front room, and I was seated next to her. This girl had been in the church that I was attending at that time. It was a local church. It wasn't a Calvary. It was a, a Baptist church that I was attending at that time while I was going to Biola, and I had friends there. So I would go to the youth group there for fellowship. And, and she was seated there on the, the couch as I was visiting with her. She was in the choir. She went on youth uh, trips with the kids, you know, to various places and, and all. And she'd been part of the church for, for five years. And she was about 18 years old at that time. And and I, I asked her a simple question. I said, uh, Gail, her name was Gail. I said, when did, you, uh, when did you get saved? When did you give your heart to the Lord, Gail? She says, oh, I'm not. I said, you're not. Wait a minute. You, you're telling me you're not? You sing in the choir. She goes, yeah, I do. Well, why do you do that? I like to sing. I said, really? Well, you can't sing. No, I said, really? <laughs> you're kidding me. I said, why haven't you ever given your heart to Christ? i got to ask. How could you be part of a church and not know Jesus? She says, you know, I've never been asked about giving my heart to Jesus. I guess I never think about it. I said, really? I said, well, now we're having a conversation about it. I said, you realize certain things. I shared the gospel with her. And I said, do you want to get right with God? Do you want to give your heart to Jesus, Gail? She said, you know, I do. This was a girl that was in the church for years, singing in the choir, going on youth events, part of the Bible studies. That's how I met her. She didn't know the Lord. Is it possible that people can go to church, do those things, and not know the Lord? Absolutely. And, and when this happens in the parable, Jesus says these are people, many of them are people who have been planted there. Those who don't give their hearts to Christ. Gail did, but those who don't give their hearts to Christ who act as one who dulls people. I was, in, I was with the same group, a similar group of people from the same place. We were on our way somewhere. I turned and began to speak to a young lady who was going with us on an outing. And, and I turned to her and I said, uh, when did you give your heart to Christ? She says, I'm not a believer in Christ. I said, really, why not? And I had a conversation with her and I'm sharing with her the gospel. Isn't that what Christians do? So I'm sharing with her the gospel. Sounds like I was always talking just to girls, huh? But anyway, I was, maybe I can lead my wife to the Lord, um, which actually I did, but that's a different story. So, so I said to her, the gospel. And, and, and when we all arrived, later on, one of the guys took me aside and said, you're pushing Jesus down people's throats. And I started thinking, is that what I'm doing? When I tell him about the Lord, is that interpreted as pushing Jesus down people's throats? What happened to the church? Well, you have tares amongst the church. It can dull the life of the church. And Jesus gives a parable about that. He says the enemy does that. He sows tares amongst the wheat. And uh, Jesus is saying that the church is going to be infiltrated. There'll be people in the church, the visible church, who aren't saved, but they still attend. How does it happen again? When men slept, well, the church is asleep in the light and the devil's inspiring people and sometimes even to, and this sounds odd, but even to pastor churches, others just simply attend. You see, what happens when you don't teach the word? Uh, the tares can become comfortable. That's why Jesus would use the phrase when men slept. They're not aware. Well, part of it would be 
that the, the pastor teachers, those who are leading, are not proclaiming the truth of the gospel. And so people can become very comfortable if they're entertained, if they're informed, if they like the variety of entertainment aspects of the church, the personality and eloquence of the pastor, and a variety of other things, the, the things that are offered that they like, the events, the retreats, you name it, and they can come, they can be there, and, and ultimately sometimes they can even influence and infect. The church was asleep. The word of God is not being preached very often in that church. You know, Satan also produces false signs and wonders. He can do that. When Moses stood before Pharaoh, Moses turned his own staff into, turned a staff into a snake. In Exodus chapter 7, verses 11 and 12, it says, Pharaoh summoned the wise men and sorcerers and the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and it became a, a snake, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Satan is a counterfeiter. He attempts to duplicate what God does. He, he wants to be like God. He even is, has a, a counterfeit Messiah. And that counterfeit Messiah, the scripture refers to that one as Antichrist. Now the Antichrist, we'll be looking at him in just a moment, but, but Antichrist will not be clearly recognizable from outer appearance. It's not like he's going to walk into a room with a, a, a red cape and horns or something like that with a tail. He's, he's not going to do that. He's going to come in and he's going to be beautiful. He's, he's going to have a, a beauty and an attractiveness about him. You see, Satan is a master of using outer appearance to deceive people. Man habitually looks at the outside. And so he's, he disguises his evil with beauty. In 2 Corinthians 11, 13, and 14, Paul said, Such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. This has been called the beautiful side of evil. If you could see, if I could see with my eyes and, and apprehend what the enemy really is, if he was really fully disclosed, the, the perversion and twisted, the malice, the evil, you wouldn't have anything to do with him. But he disguises himself like that old story of Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf who dresses up to, to deceive her. He disguises himself, and, and you don't see him. You, you, you don't recognize him. And he's a counterfeiter is what it is. And his, his, his evil is actually attractive. And Antichrist is attractive. He's charming. He'll be intelligent, eloquent, charismatic, especially persuasive. He's going to fit into the world's movers and the world's shakers. He's going to have the backing of, of Hollywood and, and, and all the other production um, the companies that produce the movies and all throughout the world. He'll have their backing He'll have the backing of the politicians and, and all the talk show hosts and, and all the media. They're all going to think that he speaks in a wonderful way. He's so eloquent. He's bringing the right message. We need to hear this. And anybody who disagrees with him, well, that person ought to be banned. He'll fit in lecturing at major universities, giving speeches perhaps before Congress or the UN. He's going to bring solutions that people are, are striving for. He's going to bring solutions to the climate situation, energy problems, the various wars and, and various religious wars, and he's going to draw the admiration of the world. When you look at Scripture, the Antichrist is the subject of over 100 passages in Scripture. He's referred to in, in 2 Thessalonians and 1 John and the book of Daniel, obviously, various times here in the Revelation. And he's spoken of quite often. There are those who wonder if he may be presently alive on planet Earth, and that's something I can't answer. I can't say that he is or he isn't. We don't know. But every day brings his emergence closer. To be honest with you, you know, as we're looking at this, I have to speak of the Antichrist. We need to speak. We need to be prepared. We need to be aware. But I prefer looking at Jesus Christ and not the Antichrist. But if we're going to have the whole counsel of God, we have to view him also. And by looking at him, we have uh, the blessing of being prepared to preach the true Christ. And so that's what we'll be looking at here in this chapter. So beginning at verse 1, that was your introduction, verse 1. 
I stood on the sand of the sea. I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Notice this. Notice how John says that he saw a beast rising out of the sea. There are various ways that, that commentators look at this phrase, out of the sea. Some think it's literal. They think he's literally coming out of the Mediterranean. Uh, others say that it may be speaking of coming out of the abyss. He may be speaking of the sea of humanity because that's an image that is later used in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, where it says, He said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So it may be that it's out of the sea of humanity. And out of the sea of humanity emerges the beast, the Antichrist, one who is empowered by Satan. Antichrist is a human being. He's also identified in Scripture by various names. He's called the man of sin. He's called the son of perdition. He's the lawless one, the little horn. He's the willful king. He's also known as the beast, but he's especially known by the name Antichrist. He is one who blasphemes and opposes Jesus. He is anti-Jesus, but he also presents himself as Messiah instead of the real Christ. You see, during the tribulation, in the midst of the chaos and confusion, Antichrist rises to power. People are looking for, longing for, someone to bring peace to the world. They're going to desire a strong leader, a charismatic leader, to bring unity in the midst of all the confusion and chaos. This worldwide longing, it's not just here in the States, it's throughout the world. This worldwide longing will give him opportunity to gain power, to deceive the world. The question has to be asked, how? How will that happen? Why would he be welcomed like that? Uh, one, the, the world has been prepared to receive this kind of person throughout its history. There's been a long line of would-be rulers dating back thousands of years. There have always been people who have wanted to rule the world. We're familiar with some of their names. Scripture speaks of them, like Nebuchadnezzar or Alexander the Great. We know that the Roman Caesars in, in, in the early days, the Roman Caesars wanted to be world rulers. We know in, in, in more recent times, Stalin and Hitler and Mao and others like that had this ambition to rule the world. That's not something that's new. So Antichrist will succeed at what all the others fail to do. He's going to be welcomed. This one will be welcomed as the political world ruler. Now, one of the things that is a bit unique about Antichrist is not only is he going to be a political leader, and we'll see this more clearly later on in Revelation, not only is he a political leader, he is also going to have a, a, be a religious leader. He's, he's the embodiment of what it means to reject Jesus Christ, the true Messiah. In, in a very basic sense, the, the, an antichrist is, is someone who denies Jesus as, as Messiah. In 1 John 4, verse 3, every spirit that doesn't confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. That, that spirit of antichrist is already here. That spirit has been here, John wrote 2,000 years ago. He says it's already here. We see it. We see that spirit in our day because it's not new to our day. It's been something that the world has done whenever the gospel has been preached, wherever churches have been planted. There's a spirit of rejection. No, Jesus Christ cannot be the true Christ. No, we don't believe that. We have our own religion. We have our own beliefs. We have our own prophets. We have our own leaders. No, Jesus Christ, no. He's okay for you Christians, but we follow Moses. Or he's okay for you Christians, but we follow Buddha or we follow Muhammad. There's always been a spirit of rejection of Jesus Christ. It's not new. And, and so John pointed that out. This, he said, is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You see, the church had been taught and warned and even been exhorted to be on the alert, to be aware because in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, John said, little children, it's the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have come, 
by which we know that it is the last hour. What is going to happen? How will Antichrist be welcomed by the world? Well, false prophets. False prophets are preparing the way for him. False prophets prepare an atmosphere of acceptance. People already have an inclination to receive what he's saying. This is because he's going to teach what they approve of. He's not going to say something to them or give a message that's going to call them to do something that they're not already inclined to do. What he's going to do is he's going to tickle their ears. What he's going to do is he's going to say things that they want to hear and they, that they believe already. That's how he gets in. He's going to, he's going to say things that, that people think, yeah, that's right. That's how it should be. That's, it's a real simple process, fellas and ladies. We already know that. We already know that. All you got to do is watch TV. All you got to do is watch a commercial. All you have to do is watch a movie. It's already there. This attitude, this acceptance of something that is other than Christ is already there. Those of you who share your faith with people, you have those responses. You have people say that to you, say things of rejection. I, I've shared this more than once over the years, but I was on a, a train. My wife and I were doing ministry in Europe, and we were on a train uh, coming in England. On, we were in Dover. We got on a train, and we were on our way to London. And as we were on our way to London, uh, a young woman sat across from Marie and me, sat, actually, was she across? No. Yeah, she, and it doesn't matter. She was there. Anyway, she, she, she was an American. She was from Massachusetts. And, and she sees us and begins to speak to us. And she says, um, I said, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Massachusetts. And, and she starts just telling me her whole story. And I'm, I'm cool with that. Yeah, tell me. I'm interested. You know, yeah, I'm from Massachusetts, such and so city. And she goes, I... I I said, well, what are you doing in, 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 in here? Where are you going? Well, I'm going to London. I'm going to be working there. Oh, really? What do you do? Oh, I, 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 I sing dirty songs in bars. That's what she said. She called them body, B-A-W-D-Y, body. They're nasty, nasty songs. I sing nasty songs. I said, really? Sing me one. No, I said, really? <laughs> I'll buy your album. So I, I said... Really? She goes, yeah. And she's telling me all about her, her life and her story and this and that. And I'm, I'm, I'm real interested. You know, I listen to people. I want to hear what she's all about. You know, I'm not, I'm not judging her. I'm not doing anything. I'm just letting her talk. She's American. And she's telling me who she is. And if the Lord gives me an opportunity, I'll share. If not, then I just listen. I mean, I'm not going to shove something down her throat. But she got mad because as she's telling me that, she finally says, and you, what do you do? <laughs> oh, boy, here we go. So... <laughs> I said, well, I'm a pastor. That's as far as I got. <laughs> she says, this is true. She looks at me, and she says, kind of an angry, well, it was angry, not kind of, it was angry. She says, I hate it when people shove Jesus down my throat. She said that. And I'm looking, at her, and you ask me what I do, I'm a pastor. So I punched her. I got mad. No, I, I now sing a song. So I said... So I said, really? You hate it when Christians shove the gospel down your throat? I hadn't said a word. I had said, I'm a pastor. That was it. That set her off. I said, you don't like Christians shoving things down your throat, but it's okay for you to shove your philosophy down our throats. She gets all insulted. She goes, what do you mean? When do I shove my philosophy down your throat. When is my philosophy shoved down your throat? I said, every time I turn on the television, every time I drive my car and I see a billboard, every time I go to a movie, every time I listen to a song, every time I read a magazine article or a newspaper, your philosophy is shoved down my throat 24 hours a day, every day. And you're telling me that I shove my philosophy down your throat? I haven't even spoken to you. Shut up, woman. No, I said I haven't, <laughs> I haven't even spoken. I'm a little tired, forgive me. I said, <laughs> I, said I, haven't, 
I haven't said a word to you. But see, it's true, guys, and you know it and I know it. You know it and I know it. Many of you will watch the Super Bowl today. Nothing wrong with that. I sleep during it. It's a good nap. <laughs> but, my jersey, you know, but. What kind of commercials are going to be on today? Well, either food, uh, beer, sometimes hard, harder liquor. I mean, that's what you're, that's right. I mean, that's the commercials. If they didn't think that those commercials could convince you, why would they spend the hundreds of thousands of dollars for 30 seconds for that commercial? Why would they do that? They know that it affects you. It's creating an atmosphere. We already have that atmosphere. We just don't see it. We're just not aware of it. It's because we've gotten used to it. That's the way it is. It's kind of like a baby. The first time a baby hurts, the baby gets hurt with, you know, uh, maybe a needle when they get a, a shot or whatever, and they react like, you know, it's the worst pain. Well, it is. It's the worst pain they've ever felt. But they get older, and that pain no longer is as bad. Why? Because the first, they always said, the first cut is always the deepest. The first pain is always the most serious. And then what happens is you kind of get used to it. And sometimes you get so used to it that you become a boxer. <laughs> you get used to it. That's what happens, talking to you. And that's what happens. <laughs> you get used to it. Well, guess what? The atmosphere of ungodliness is something you can get used to. You can get used to it. And that's what's going to take place. You see, the false prophets would be fostering an atmosphere to accept him. We already have that disposition to receive what he's offering. And he's going to appeal to our carnal appetites. In the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, chapter 5, verse 31, the prophet said, the prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? He's tickling our ears with these kinds of things. His message is going to appeal to the natural man, and it will not call for repentance. Again, that's an ancient method that the devil has used to deceive people. And in the Old Testament book of Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 14, it reads, your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not uncovered your iniquity to bring back your captives, but have envisioned for you false prophecies and delusions. They haven't called you to repent. They haven't called you to break before God, to say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Well, in order for people to receive him in his message, delusion needs to take place. Jesus taught his men that deception would be the distinguishing mark of the last days. He was speaking to his men in Matthew 24. He had spoken concerning all the stones and everything being torn down as they were showing him the beauty of the temple, and, and it intrigued them. So in Matthew 24, verses 3 and 5, it says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, uh, uh, Take heed that no one deceives you. It's your responsibility not to be deluded. Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Be on the alert. What is the primary sign of the last days? Delusion, deception, preparation for Antichrist. That is the sign and today, spiritual deception is normal. It's even accepted by many, including Christians. Because many reject actual Bible teaching, they'll believe pretty much anything. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, A time is coming when people will no longer listen to right teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever they want to hear. And that's taking place. You see, after the rapture, a great rejection of Christ is going to result. False prophets will proclaim Antichrist as Messiah. And at that time, this one who's also the man of sin, the Antichrist, he will be revealed. He is the son of perdition. And so John is speaking of that. And go back to verse 1. You think, are we going to get to verse 10? Yes, we will. <laughs> so he said, I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. 
and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. John describes him. John is describing not only an individual antichrist, but also a kingdom. This is one who is dedicated completely to Satan. He's empowered demonically, and he is what has been called consummate evil. His description is similar to what we saw in chapter 12, verse 3, describing Satan. Now, Antichrist has, notice, seven heads, ten horns, and on the horns are ten crowns. Now, the seven heads represent kings. We see that in Revelation 17, verse 3. Kings that are over seven successive world empires. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Antichrist kingdom. He has ten horns. As I mentioned before, horns in the Bible can be used to represent power. Psalm 75.10 says, I will cut off the horns of all the wicked, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. So that represents power. So the horns tell us that the kings who are ruling under Antichrist have great power. He has ten crowns. Crowns are symbolic of governmental authority, even nations. We know that Antichrist is a world ruler. The number ten represents the world. It says on each head there are blasphemous names. And when it says on each head is a blasphemous name, that describes the nature of his kingdom. Now in many kingdoms over the ages, rulers have given themselves divine titles. Each nation's leader will be a rejecter of God and blasphemous. Even during the early days of the church, part of the persecution that real believers went through was when Nero was demanding that there would be a, a pinch of incense burned uh, in front of an image, and uh, the phrase uh, that uh, Caesar is Lord was to be uttered by the individual who was offering that pinch of incense. And because believers said, no, Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not, Great persecution broke out. It's, it's happened in history before. It will happen again. And he wants to be known by a divine name. Now notice in verse 2, it says, The beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And so this description of his kingdom reminds us of a vision that the prophet Daniel had 600 years before. You see, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, Daniel had a dream previewing successive kingdoms leading to the Antichrists. And when you look at the different uh, uh, descriptions, and it's, it's all uh, interpreted for us, he saw a lion representing the, the kingdom of Babylon. He saw a bear, which is Medo-Persia. He saw a leopard, which represented Greece. And he also saw a terrible beast. Now, the first three descriptions are the same given in Revelation 13 too. The interpretation for this was given in Daniel when speaking of the fourth, fourth beast. In Daniel 7, 23 through 25, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, break it to pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from, his, from this kingdom and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. A time and times and half a time represents three and a half years. Well, this fourth empire is like, is like the Roman Empire in, incorporating the attributes of the other three. But notice in verse 2, it says the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. This dragon is Satan. Satan gave him his power. At this time, God will allow him to rise to power. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, For this lawlessness is already at work secretly and will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. He is satanically energized. And because he is, no human being will be able to withstand him. That's why they're saying, who is able to make war with him. No human being can withstand him. He will have unrestrained freedom of action. Nobody is going to stop him. In Daniel 8, 23 and 24, it says, In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king 
a master of intrigue will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty man and the holy people. Antichrist is going to develop a government, a government that is satanically empowered and is a dictatorship, and the entire world will come under his spell. In verse 3, he said, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. This may be, and most commentators that I, that I use said this is an assassination attempt, but it is a counterfeit death, a counterfeit death, burial, and resurrection, which will cause people to think he's the true Messiah. His deadly wound was healed, and what happens is the world marvels and follows him. So his apparent death and resurrection convinces people that he is Messiah. This is a world leader. This isn't a, a local leader. And, and so what happens, it says in verse 4, they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So the, wor the, the world will worship him. Why? They believe he's Messiah. Notice in verse 4, it says they worship the dragon. That is the heart of Satan's rebellion as recorded in Isaiah 14. I will be like the Most High God. I will be worshipped. His desire to receive worship uh, is what led to the rebellion of Satan against God. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. He went on in verses 9 and 10 of 2 Thessalonians 2 and he said the coming of the lawless one will be in a, a, accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. They refuse the gospel. You speak to someone about Jesus, and they say, it's good for you, it's not good for me. I can't, I can't tell you how I was, when I first got saved, and I was so excited about telling people about the Lord. And I would tell them, you know Jesus, and he changes lives. And they say, well, you know, that's good for you. And I, I'm glad... And I still remember one guy who said to me, you know, you, you needed God. You know, I don't. And I still remember someone saying, yeah, you Christians, you need, you need, a, you know, you need someone to carry you. You know, you, you need a crutch. You know, it's what you need. You guys need crutches, you know. And I said, no, I don't. I don't need a crutch. I, I need a stretcher. <laughs> I, I can't walk. I said, no, crutch, I could still walk. But a stretcher, no. I, I need a stretcher because I can't walk and I need Jesus to carry me. There's nothing wrong in admitting my weakness. And the problem that many people have is they're refusing to, to acknowledge their own. And so this one is self-important. He's given a mouth, it says in verse 5, speaking great things and blasphemies. God allows him to use the tactic of arrogantly insulting and showing contempt for God. In Daniel 7.25, again, it says, he shall speak pompous words. The word pompous simply means self-important. He shall speak self-important, pompous words against the Most High. And blasphemy is his method of undermining God because blasphemy actually reduces God. He's going to speak Satan's frustrated hatred and rage. He'll speak it out because Satan has frustration and rage against God, and he's going to be the one who speaks it. In Daniel eleven thirty six 36, and 37, this willful king, the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself against every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women nor will he regard any God, but will exalt himself above them all. He will speak things against God. Notice Daniel said he will say unheard of things against God. And you say, is that possible? Of course. Again, watch TV. 
you can, you, you can use God's name in vain. I've, I've, I've been watching a TV program, a regular program, and somebody uses God's name in vain. And I think of the scripture which says to us, I will not hold him guiltless who uses my name in vain. And yet they say it's so easy. It's in songs. The kids are singing today. The young people listen to. They, they hear it. And, and, and it's dulled them. But you can't use other words. You can't use some words in our society. I don't want to even repeat them or even call, you know, bring to mind the words that I'm referring to. But you know that there are words that have banned. They've been banned. You can't say these words. You can't say these words, whatever they may be. And you know them. They're the unnamed words. But you can use God's name in vain. And it's just part of the dialogue. Somebody wrote that down in the script and said, you say this, and the actor says it. And sometimes it grieves my heart to see believers uttering those words. And I'm thinking, somebody's not teaching you the word of God. God said, I will not hold him guiltless. He takes my name in vain. And yet you can't use the Q word, and you can't use the N word, and you can't use, there's so many Words that we're being told you can't use. And I agree. I don't think you should use those words. Who's to say that you should? I don't think you should. I just, I don't. But don't tell me that, that those words are equal to the name of God. And what has happened is he will speak these blasphemies and people are so used to hearing it, they don't think anything of it. Not a thing. It says in verse 5, he was given authority to continue for 42 months. He was given authority, which tells us that the authority he has, he's received from the Lord, and it's limited. He's not going to rule forever. He exercises authority during the seven-year period. His complete rule doesn't materialize until the last three and a half years in what's called the Great Tribulation. It will begin, it appears, when he breaks the covenant that he had made with Israel. Because in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, it says, well, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them Suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, they will not escape. He will be completely defeated when Jesus returns. In Revelation 19, 20, the beast was captured. With him, the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. And the two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. I wanted to make sure to say that because he doesn't get away with what he's done. He will be judged. And I wanted to make sure that we had an upbeat moment with this guy because he's such a downer. It says in verse 6, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and all authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Satan's mouthpiece, he utters contempt toward God, all things that are holy. Psalm 36, 1 through 3 says, An oracle is within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There's no fear of God before his eyes. For in his own eyes, he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. The words of his mouth are wicked and deceitful. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. My mom was speaking to a woman one time. My mom used to love to share the gospel. And she was sharing with a woman. And uh, as she shared, she said to the woman, do you think you'd like to give your heart to Christ? And the woman, my mom told me, said to her, yes, I would. I'd like to give my heart to Jesus. And so my mom said, then pray with me. And my mom said that she said, I repeat after me and, we'll, and you can open your heart to Christ. And she says, okay. And my mom says, God, forgive me a sinner. And when my mom said that, she said, the woman said, I am not a sinner. And, there are, and my mom said, David, can you believe that? She said, I am not a sinner. And I said, yes, you are. Go to hell. That was my mom. That was, she really did. That was my mom. And I said, Mama, no. That, that, that's, that's, not, that's not how you preach the gospel, Mama. Oh, well, she's going to go to hell. I said, Mom, please. You're smiling when you're saying that. That's... But that was my mom. She had a lot to learn. She had such a zeal. But this woman refused. She said, I am not a sinner. But we all have sin fall short of the glory of God. There's no perfect person on the face of the earth. Only one, Jesus Christ. 
And so these people will hear these things and agree. And he's going to basically get accepted. It was granted in verse 7 for him to make war with the saints, to overcome them. As Satan's instrument, he persecutes the Jewish and Gentile believers. These, by the way, were mentioned to us in chapter 7, verse 9, and verses 13 through 17. These are what are called tribulation saints. You see, many believers worldwide will be persecuted and will perish as martyrs. And the dream of worldwide conquest is realized by Antichrist. Verse 7, all authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Well, it says every tongue, tribe, and nation, he had authority. It's a counterfeit. Again, it's a counterfeit of what we call the millennial or the thousand-year reign of Christ. It's not the, the reign of Christ for peace and all. It's the great tribulation. It, it actually results in world, worldwide war, and it'll end when Jesus returns. It says in verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names, notice, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. All who dwell on the earth is another way of speaking the unbelievers. These are the ones who rejected the gospel. They're unsaved, both Jew and Gentile. Second Thessalonians 2.10, Paul spoke of them as those who did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. But those whose names, he says, are written in the Lamb's book of life will not worship him. The book of life speaks of God's record of those who are saved. And these are the ones who have been saved and secured by Christ. Some of those will be persecuted to the death, but they cannot be removed from Jesus' hand. And then he says this, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Listen up. Listen up. You see, we have been warned. There is already a spirit of ecumenicalism where everything just kind of mouths into one. You believe in this God, I believe in this God, but really it's the same God under different names. Some of you have heard that argument. I have. Well, you call him Jehovah. I call him Allah. That's the same God. No, it's not. But they say it is. And so what you end up with is a spirit of ecumenicalism where you have the bumper stickers that say coexist, and that's really a spirit of the age where people are drawing you. And that's what's happening. But we've been warned. That's what he's saying. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. By hearing the message of the gospel, by knowing that, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, by knowing that, that, that uh, we're appointed unto wrath until we receive Christ, and he takes upon himself our sin. That's the reason he came, that he died. He was buried, resurrected, in order that I might have life in him. He forgave me of my sins, and I trust him for that, and I became a believer, and now I follow God. This is part of the Christian gospel. But people don't want to hear it. They want to know that in the, in their, their, they make the best effort and they do the most that they can and, and I'm a good person. I'm not a bad person. Yes, you are and so am I and that's why I need a, a savior. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I need Christ. There's nothing wrong with admitting the truth. Well, this spirit of ecumenicalism where everything's all the same is growing now and it's going to continue growing until he's accepted. The world will wonder after the beast. A genuine Christians, we resist. We will be persecuted to the death. And people say, why do you churches still meet when the government tells you not to? Because we don't give in to the spirit of the age. Because we know that Jesus Christ is to be worshipped. We've been commanded to do that. We've been commanded to fellowship. We take precautions. We don't try and cause people to get ill. But we are here to worship Jesus Christ. And there are many, even believers, who get mad at us, people like me. And they say, you don't love people. And I say to them, no, you don't love the Lord. Because if you love the Lord, you would worship him. Oh, I can worship him at home. That's why you do that every Sunday with your bunny slippers. When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus Christ? When's the last time you served him? When's the last time you got involved? When is the last time you gave? When is the last time you did anything other than saying, I'm a Christian? No, there are, there are tares in the church. Now, I'm not calling anybody here a tear. I'm not. I'm not saying to you on, 
on, uh, watch it online that you're a terror. Because I know some of you are crying right now. I'm not talking to you that way. <laughs> what I'm saying is that's just a fact, isn't it? Am I talking to myself? No, that's a fact. That's a fact. And when I think I'm better than God, when I think I don't need a Savior, I am wrong. I needed Jesus Christ. He saved me. He transformed me. He forgave me. He gave me, well, my name is in the Lamb's book of life. And I will see him one day face to face, not because of any righteousness that I have, but because of his righteousness. That's the gospel. And the church has passed that on for centuries. In, in Mark 13, 11 through 13, I'll close with this. It says, Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And in Christ, here we are, we shall stand. We stand in Jesus Christ. We will stand because he makes us to stand. We have victory. We are more than conquerors. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And one of these days, we will see him face to face. And I long to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So we will hold firm to Jesus Christ. No, it's Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist.